So I'm just gonna preach a one-off sermon today. Is that okay? I said all that to tell you this, that I'm just preaching a one-off sermon. This isn't a series. And then when, after Steve McDaniel comes, I'm going to start a series. I'll go ahead and tell you what it is because if I don't tell you what it is, then I won't do it, okay? I'll probably come up with something else. I wanna preach a series called Brick by Brick. And we're gonna talk about how the Lord builds the house and how we get to play a part in the kingdom of God, brick by brick. Somebody say brick by brick. Amen. Well, we better get started because I have some scripture for you today. 1 Samuel chapter 20. As you're going there, I just want to set up the set this up. 1 Samuel chapter 20 uh, is, uh, what's happening is, is David was a shepherd boy. A lot of you know this story, and if you don't, it's okay. You don't have to, to know the Bible to belong here and to believe here, so I'm going to set it up for you. David was a shepherd boy, and he had many brothers, and long story short, he was in the field. He was anointed king. He was anointed by Samuel to become king of, of Israel, and so what took place was, is he was, as soon as he was anointed king, he went back to doing exactly what he was doing. He went back to being a shepherd boy. Though he was anointed, though this prophet of God came in and anointed him and said, you're going to be king, he wasn't king yet because the king at the time was a guy by the name of Saul, King Saul. And he was the king at the time. Eventually, David would do something that is very famous today. He would kill a giant named Goliath. And when you're watching sports matches, they'll often reference to this biblical story, all this is that David and Goliath match today. Uh, and, and it's this idea of David, this small shepherd boy, taking out Goliath with a sling and a stone. He killed Goliath. He got the eye of the king because nobody else would fight this giant. And the king said, I want this boy to come and serve in my kingdom. And so here's David anointed to be king, serving in the kingdom that he would once have, that he would soon to have. Here he is serving. He would play the instrument. The Bible says he was good looking, a good-looking guitar player, liar player. And so he was a rock star shepherd boy. He looked handsome. He played the guitar well. And Saul, the king, would have him in his courts to soothe him and play for him. He would eventually become a warrior. And then as they would ride out to battle, David would be known for killing more men than Saul. And then Saul, the king, because people, as they rode back into the city, would sing songs like, Saul has killed his thousands. And then Saul's like, yeah, I'm the king. And then they would say, David's killed his tens of thousands. And then Saul would be like, what are they doing singing about? I'm the king. And so Saul became jealous of David. How many of you know that jealousy will eventually lead you down a dark path? If you're constantly looking out your, the window of your life at everybody else's life and jealousy begins to set in, you'll begin down a dark path. And Saul began down that dark path. He attempted to kill David. In fact, David was in his courts and he picked up a spear, Saul did, and chunked it at David. The Bible said he, had, he evaded David. And I've been watching Netflix's Cobra Kai, so I kind of have a better picture of how he evaded him. And I know the ninja moves and the karate moves to be able to evade spears now that I watch Cobra Kai. Thank you, Daniel, son. And so, I, I, and so David evaded Saul, was not killed by the spear, but eventually, and, and we see throughout David's life, he's running from Saul. He's, he's attempting, it, Saul is constantly trying to kill David. In fact, David twice has the opportunity to kill Saul, and he doesn't because he's honoring God's anointed who was king at the time, Saul. But there's another person I want to talk to you about in the story, and that's Saul's son. His name is Jonathan. Jonathan became friends with David. Not just friends. I mean, these guys were close friends. It, the Bible says that their souls were like bonded together. So this was a deep friendship that you can't quantify. You can't describe. They were bonded together, David and Jonathan. And now Saul finds himself in a catch-22 because his son, his, his son was best friends with David who he wanted to kill. Second, first Samuel chapter 20. I want to read to you this. This gives you a little picture of Jonathan's friendship with David and a little picture of what's happening around this. I want to start quickly in verse 12. And Jonathan said to David, 
the Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow, or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed towards you, David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? So Jonathan is now on a spying mission to see if Saul really wants to kill David. Jonathan, surely my dad doesn't want to kill you. Jonathan's now going to find out. But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan. And more, also if I do not disclose it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die and do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. This is a conversation between Jonathan and David. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to him, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed, because your seat will be empty, because David would sit at Saul's table. On the third day, go down quickly to the place where you hid yourself, when the matter was in hand, and and remain beside the stone heap. And I will shoot three arrows to the side of it, as though I shot at a mark. And behold, I will send the boy, saying, go find the arrows. If I say to the boy, look, the arrows are on this side of you, take them, then you are to come. For as the Lord lives, it is safe for you, and there is no danger. But if I say to the youth, look, the arrows are behind you, then go, for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the, for the matter of which you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. Do you see this bond that David and Jonathan have? Verse 24. So David hid himself in the field. And when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat food. The king sat on his seat at, uh, as a, at other times and the seat by the wall, uh, the seat by the wall, Jonathan sat opposite and Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Yet Saul did not say anything that day for he thought something has happened to him he's not clean surely he is not clean but on the second day the day after the new moon David's place was empty and Saul said to Jonathan his son why has not the son of Jesse come to to the meal either yesterday or today Jonathan answered Saul David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem He said, let me go, for our clan holds a sacrifice in the city, and my brother has commanded me to be there. So now, if I have found favor in your eyes, let me get away and see my brothers. For this reason, he has not come to the king's table. Verse 30, then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse? to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness. Verse 31, for as long as the son, watch this, now this is the important part that I want to come to. Verse 31, Saul speaking to his son Jonathan, for as long as the son of Jesse, who's David, for as long as David lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he will surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month. For he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. This sounds like a really weird family dynamic. How many of you at your family table throw spears at people? How many of you are chunking spears? I mean, maybe uh, for those of you who have family reunions, there's moments where you'd like to chunk a spear. But he's already chunked spears at David, who was so close to him. Now he's chunking spears at his son, Jonathan, because he wants David dead. But here's, here's the significant part about this. Saul was king. Saul was not worried about his throne being 
uh, being uh, set apart. His, he was not worried about his, his throne being taken over. He was worried about Jonathan's throne being taken over, his son. Because Saul, after Saul died, Jonathan would take the seat on the throne. And Jonathan knew this. Jonathan also knew that David was anointed to be king. And if Jonathan wanted so badly to be king and wanted to have this throne, he might have taken up his dad's side, Saul, and said, yeah, let's kill him. Or even if he just wanted to say, I, I'm and not even help David and let Saul, his father, kill him, then Jonathan would become king. Jonathan's friendship with David paved a way for David to become king, but therefore he forfeited his own throne. He, Jonathan gave up his throne for David. I want to talk to you today on this subject. Give up your throne. Give up your throne. For those of you who, um, who have kids, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's these moments where you're trying to help your child at a young age. I experience this almost on a daily basis when I get them ready for school. And I'm putting, especially in the, as soon as it gets cold, you're putting layers on. And they're screaming. They're still tired. They, ha they haven't had a full bowl of cereal. And surely they haven't had coffee. I've had a little bit of coffee. And I'm trying to throw, come on, we're late for school. We're throwing clothes on them. And they're like, stop it. And they're trying to do it. And they're like, they're like, like evading and like trying to get away and I'm like stop just stay still and you want to like just put your foot and just like you know I'm just kidding that's child abuse don't do that but you're like get get the clothes on and they're and they're trying to do it themselves but what they don't know is that you're you're trying to help them and so many of us are like that in our relationship with God we're trying to do stuff on our own and God is trying to help us and there's a struggle between our will and God's will there's a struggle between our throne and God's throne. There's this struggle between the two. Oh, I remember, I remember this one time when I, when I was, we had a night of worship. It was like a night of worship and healing at the church um, in the U.S. where I came from. And we were having this night of worship. And I remember standing there in the front and I, I, st I started to exit because I had to go use the toilet really bad, you know? You know these moments when you got to use the toilet. You're like, everything inside, you can't think about anything else. There's no focus. You know what I'm talking about? Like toilet, that's all I can think of. Get to wherever I need to go to use the toilet. Got to use the toilet. And I'm walking through through the worship center and all of a sudden I see this lady sitting down and something inside of my heart says go pray for her and I'm like whoa 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 I got to use the toilet Holy Spirit go pray for her can I can I use the toilet first no go pray for her but 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 I'll be more focused if I just use the toilet and then I come back no go pray for her now and I'm like, okay, fine. It's going to be a short prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And I said, hey, is there anything I can pray for you about? She said, actually, yes. I, they, they've recently found a tumor, a cancerous tumor in my brain, and I'm here to be prayed for to, be, to have healing in my, in my body. And she's sitting in the far back. Nope, she hadn't gone up for prayer or anything. And she's just sitting here in the far back. And she, and she says, I, I, go in, I go in next week for my next scan. And I said, okay, let's pray. Let's pray. So I, so I prayed for her really quickly and went to the bathroom. And then two weeks later, I realized, oh, whatever happened to that lady that I, that I prayed for? I reached out to somebody I knew uh, who knew who this lady was. And she, they said, yeah, she got her scan back and the cancer was gone. And I'm like, well, good thing I didn't go to the toilet. Why am I talking to you about that? Because, because I don't know about you, but oftentimes I'm constantly trying to live in my own will. I'm trying to constantly control my own life. And what God is telling us today, the, the key to following Jesus is giving up your throne. Giving up your throne to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You were never meant to sit on the throne. This story of Jonathan and David is a picture of the New Testament. Jonathan, who was heir to the throne, gave his throne to David. Well, we see a similar story in the Gospels when not Jonathan, but John 
came to prepare the way for the one that was coming. In, uh, in Mark chapter 1, it's, it, it talks about preparing the way. Preparing the way. Let me read it to you. We're just going to read scripture today. Is that okay? Mark chapter 1. Let me find it. Mark chapter 1 talks about John the Baptist. Verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, must increase, talking about Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. You see, John understood the assignment. It wasn't about him. And if you think your salvation is about you, we're wrong. It's because what we try to do is we try to put ourselves on the throne of our life. This is the ugliest throne I've ever seen. But we'll put ourselves on the throne of our own life. When we want to be in control of everything, we want to be in control of the relationships in our life. You're, 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 we, we, we can try to be in control of the people and control the dynamics of the relationships. When we sit on the throne of our own life, our whole purpose, we're, you weren't built for the throne. He was. He's on the throne. He is sitting on the throne. We have to be people who say, I'm giving up my throne, my control for him. You, you, know you're, you know you're on the throne of your own life when everything that you do becomes stressful. It seems like everything is stressful because what you're doing is, is you're holding on to. I'll never let go. You're like, I'm going to stay. I, I'm, I'm in control of my life. I, I, I know the plans I have for me, declares me. And I'm going to stay in control. I'm going to, st this is my purpose for my life. I'm in control. When you're stressed out, when you're constantly worrying and, and, and going in circles of, oh, what is that? I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do this. And, it's, and, and you feel as if, if you don't, then everything unhinges in your life. Give up your throne. Give up your throne. You're not the CEO of your universe. Give up your throne. You're, sit, you're, you're on the throne of your life when you're, when you're constantly looking for everybody else's acceptance. If you think about a king who sits on a throne, everything stops with him. It all points to him. And it's like, look at me. I need to be accepted. Am I doing the right thing as king of my own life? Am I making the right decisions as king in my own life? Have you ever asked that? Am I making the right decisions? Am I, am I doing the right things? Am I in the right relationships? I'm sitting on the throne when I'm constantly looking for everybody else's acceptance. Did I do good today? <sighs> they didn't notice me and they should have noticed me. They should have noticed me. I, I worked really hard. I worked really hard and I can't believe they didn't notice. Your acceptance is your throne. We've got to give up the need to be accepted. My desires. All I want is this. All, and, and, and we think, we, like, like I said, we, we have the, the plans and the purposes of our life. We, we know what we want. We know our aspirations. We know, but but in order, to, in order to gain life, we have to give up life. In order to gain God's plan for our life, we have to give up our plan for our life. My desires, what I want. I know you got big plans. I know you got big plans for your life. But can I tell you, the plans of God for your life will outweigh, will outpower your plans for your life. You will make a greater impact in your world. You will make a greater, uh, greater impact in the people around you. You'll make, 
You, you will change the world around you when you submit and give up your throne and give up your plans for his plans. And I know it's scary because you want to know what the next step is. You want to know the 10-year plan, the 30 plan. I want to know I've got it all planned out when I'm going to be retired and when I'm going to do this and when I'm going to get married. And I know the plans I have, but I need to let it go. Say, give up your throne. You were never designed. What, what, here's what begins to happen. You become bitter. When you sit on your own throne, you become, to, you become bitter at everybody else around you. Because what happens is, is you're, you're trying to be in control, but life isn't fair. I don't know if your parents told you that or not. But life isn't fair. Life is rough. And as soon as life doesn't work out the way that you thought it should work out, you become bitter. Because you're sitting on the throne of control in your life. As soon as, as soon as the relationship, the person in your life says something to hurt you, and they were the ones that were there who were meant to love you, you become bitter. If you're constantly sitting on the throne of your life, you become bitter. We've got to give up our throne. You become, you become insecure. Because look, you're, you're exposed to the world around you. Everybody can see your flaws. When you're sitting on the throne of your life, you become so vulnerable and insecure that everybody else can see what's going on in your world. Or at least you fear it. And then you become insecure because you think, Somebody else, somebody's going to hurt me. Somebody's going to hurt me. Somebody's going to overthrow my, my control. Somebody's going to overthrow my little throne and my little kingdom that I've built. And you constantly, you don't let people close. You don't let people in. You don't let people around you. There becomes distance relationally between you and people because you're sitting on the throne. You become, you become insecure and you create this distance between you and people because maybe you were hurt before and that's why you're sitting on the throne. Maybe there was something in your past that caused you to be hurt and you say, I'm never gonna let that happen again. I'm in control now. They're not in control of my life. I'm in control now. They'll never hurt me again. And you create distance between you and people. Insecure. You become, you become selfish and self-centered. You always filter relationships and the people around you through your desires. What am I going to get out of that relationship? You begin to filter your Christianity and your relationship with Jesus. What do I get out of that? What do I get out of this relationship? Everybody's meant to serve me. God, God blesses me. And he's meant to serve my every need. And I've got a list of things that I need him to do in my life. Can I just encourage us today that Christianity is not about you now being in control of your life. It's, very, it's the very opposite. He says things like, take up your cross. Take up your cross. Die to yourself. Let the dead bury the dead and follow me. Drop your nets and come follow me. Sell all your possessions and come follow me. It's the very opposite, and I'm sorry to break it to some of us today, but it's not the easy button when you give your life to the Lord. It's not the easy button saying, life is great now. In fact, sometimes it might get harder because you're swimming upstream. <laughs> you're going against culture. You're going against what everybody else is doing. It's not easy. He must increase and I must decrease. It means that you decrease. I know that wasn't the five-year plan to decrease. But if he's going to increase in my life, if he's going to be enthroned in my life, then I must decrease. I know this is the weirdest analogy ever, but have you just ever been sitting on the couch watching a movie or somebody with something and you've got a bag of chips because you love chips? 
or a bag of popcorn. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, it's the intense part. You're just zero, so zeroed in in the movie. And then all of a sudden, you both reach your hand in the chip bag at the same time. And then you're stuck. And now it's the internal battle. Who's going to pull their hand out first? Because I can't get, uh, we can't get chips at the same time. You know what I'm talking about? And you're like, who's going to fold first? That's why we just do two bags of chips. Get, the, get your hand out of the bag of chips in your life and let God in. Let God do what he's going to do. Let God, let God reach into your life and heal the wounds that you've kept trying to heal. Let God sit on your throne. That's why, that's why the Bible says when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. It doesn't say Savior. He saves you. But it's when you believe and confess that he's Lord, meaning that he's on the throne of your heart and you're not. The moment of salvation, when you give your life to Jesus, it, it looks like this. It's not me anymore, Jesus, it's you. Sit on the throne of my heart. Take control. It's not my will, it's your will. Give up your throne. Give up your throne. Let me read to you really quickly what takes place when you give up your throne. Because maybe, you're, maybe this is a little depressing to you. <laughs> maybe this is a little, man, I don't know if I want to do that. And it is scary. It is hard to say, it's not my will. It's your will. What was it? Carrie Underwood, Jesus, take the wheel. Like, stop trying to drive. No, y'all don't know that song. Uh, stop trying to drive your life. Stop trying, to, stop trying to sit on the throne. And listen to me, this isn't a one-time decision. This is a daily decision to let Jesus sit on the throne of your life. To let him be Lord of your life. When he died on the cross to wash you of the shame and condemnation, from, to save you from sin and death, he went into the tomb, he rose three days later, and he sat on the throne. And his throne is way more brilliant than your throne. Second Samuel, let's go there. We were just in First Samuel. I told you I had some scripture today. But Second Samuel chapter 9. I want to read to you a little bit more scripture. But I want to show you something that took place later in the future. Jonathan surrendered his throne to David. That was God's will. Jonathan was the Old Testament John, the Baptist. David was the Old Testament Jesus. In fact, he was from Bethlehem, David was, just like another little boy we know named Jesus. David, Jesus also came from the line of David. It is a picture, what we just read in the Old Testament with Jonathan and David of the New Testament, of John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. Give up your throne. Give up your throne. It's not about me. And we're meant to take the position. We're meant to take the position of John. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. I, I, I can't save you. You can't save you. Only he can. This is what happened later. So Saul and Jonathan, father and son, were in battle and they died on the battlefield. David grieved when he heard that his friend Jonathan died. Jonathan would no longer be king. In fact, David was king now. 2 Samuel chapter 9, fast forwarding, David is king. And David said, is there still anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I'm your servant. And the king said, is there, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I might show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. There's still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. In fact, in fact, this boy, Jonathan's son, was crippled because he was running afraid for their life. He was, he was actually being carried by a servant woman because she was afraid of his life. She tripped and fell and he broke his, broke his spine or leg. He was, he was paralyzed. He was crippled. 
The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Michar, the son of Emil, at Lodabar. Lodabar means no pasture. <laughs> He's in a desolate place. He's in a place of depression. The king, David, sent and brought him from the house of Michar, the son of Emil, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, this is the boy's name, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David, and David said to Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. Can I just pause right here? Jonathan, uh, David would have had to tell Mephibosheth, Do not fear, because kings would normally ask this same question. Is there anybody left in the house of Saul? Is there anybody left? But the reason a king would have asked that question is not to show them kindness, it would be to kill them. Because the practice of the day was, if you took over a kingdom, you were now to kill anybody else in the previous kingdom so they would not take you over. It would have been David, it would have been normal for David to seek out anybody in Saul or Jonathan's line to kill them. That's why Mephibosheth, when he heard, come to David's, come to David, would have been fearful. Would have been fearful. Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Can you just experience the sigh of relief in Mephibosheth? And I will restore to you, watch this, all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant? that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and, all to, and to all his house, I have given you your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord, the king commands his servants, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. Mephibosheth, if it wasn't for David, would have been the king. Mephibosheth would have been king. But yet he was living in Lodabar, crippled. Nobody knew he was there. Probably because they, would, they were afraid of, being, of the, the, their heritage and their legacy being wiped out. So David didn't know anybody else, so he had to ask. They had to ask one of Saul's old servants to track down anybody who lived in Saul's, or from Saul's house. And they found Mephibosheth, one of Jonathan's sons. He would have been king. Can you imagine Mephibosheth? I, thinking, I would have been in that seat. I would have been in that seat. Jonathan gave up the, the throne, gave up the legacy, and now David was the king. And what they got in the place of the throne was a table. He sat at David's table. Let me just tell you this. When you give up your throne, when you allow Jesus to be enthroned on your life, to have control, for his, for his will to be prominent in your life, you sit at the table. You sit at the table with him. Mephibosheth came to the table with David. And he ate at the table always for the rest of his life as if he was one of the king's sons. When you tr you're, what you're doing is you're trading your throne for the table. And I'm telling you, though, a throne may look sexy. It may look great. It may look like I get to rule. I get to make the decisions. You'll always end up bitter. You'll always end up insecure. You'll always end up afraid. But when you sit at the table, it's not about you. It's about him. You come to the Lord's table. There's mercy at the table. There's mercy at the table. He could have killed Mephibosheth, but he gave him mercy and said, no, you're not dying today. 
You're not dying today. There's mercy at the table. When you give up your throne, you come to the table of mercy. We deserved death and hell, but he gave us life instead. That's the mercy of God. We should have been wiped off the face of the earth, but in God's mercy, he said no. Not only is there, there's, not only is there mercy, there's grace at the table. Not only did he not kill Mephibosheth, he gave to him everything that was his father or his grand, grandfather Saul's. Restored to him all the land. Gave him servants to till the land. Gave him a legacy. And just like Jesus who came, we didn't deserve Jesus. He could have, again, killed us. In his mercy, he didn't kill us. But in his grace, he gave us life and life more abundantly. When you come to the table, you experience the grace of God. The things that he gives you that you didn't deserve. I deserve death. But I got life instead. I got Holy Spirit residing in me. The gifts of the Spirit residing in me. He gave me grace at the table. For God so loved the world that he gave. There's grace at the table. Christine, or worship team, you can come. I need to, I'm going to close this down, I promise. Thank you. It's moral support. There's grace at the table. There's grace at the table. Hey, hey, Tara, I don't know if this is possible. Can you wield that cart over here? I'm going to use this as an illustration in just a moment. There's, there's, there's grace at the table. But there's also, there's also unity at the table. There's unity at the table. He was just like one of the sons. When you, sit at, when you sit at a table, thank you so much. You're the man. I didn't tell you that was coming. You can sit on the throne of your life and you can be in control and the world can center around you and we can all pat you on the back and say, hey, look at you. Look at how good you are. Or you can come to the table and you're at equal playing field. You're not better than anybody else. That's what the table represents. It's an equalizer. Everybody's equal at the table. David, the king, had to sit down at the table with Mephibosheth from Lodabar who was crippled. Who would call himself lowly like a dog. But even David, the king, wouldn't see him that way. Jesus doesn't see you that way. I don't care if you gave your life to Jesus yesterday. I don't care if you messed up yesterday. When you come to the table, it's an equalizer. There's unity at the table. Can I just tell you how broken our, I don't need to tell you how broken our world is today and how much division there is today and how much unity of, or disunity of this race or this po- political agenda or that thing or this, this opinion and everybody's so divided. What we don't, we don't need another politician to unify. We don't need that. We need the table of God to come before and say, we're all in this together. I might look different than you. I might smell different than you. I might have a different opinion than you but we are at the table together and I'm thrown of our own kingdom and sit at his table we come to his table there's unity at the table there's acceptance at the table can I just tell somebody today that you you maybe have felt like you haven't been accepted by the people around you can I tell you just to slide your chair get off the throne and come to the table because there's acceptance here there's acceptance here God accepts you for who you are God God accepts you despite your past and despite your flaws there's righteousness at the table you see when Jesus died when Jesus died on the cross, resurrected, he gave, what he gave you was a robe of righteousness. That way when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. 
He doesn't see your flaws. He sees Jesus. Mephibosheth would have walked in. Maybe he would have had to have been wheeled in, crippled. Maybe kind of like that boy I met in Guatemala because of lack of, lack of medicine and lack of doctoral help. And he would have limped in. Maybe he would have been wheeled in. I don't know. But guess what would have happened when he would have sat at the table? You wouldn't have seen his flaws. You wouldn't have seen his brokenness. You wouldn't have seen this past. You wouldn't have seen the shame. You wouldn't have seen the things that hindered him. You wouldn't have seen the things that were broken. Because he accepts me for who I am. And he clothes me in righteousness. My, my, my past, my past is covered at the table. You don't see it anymore. I come to the table of the Lord. When I sit on the throne, when I sit on the throne, I'm exposed. When I'm on the throne of my own life, I'm exposed. But when I come in a surrender and sit at the table with him, my past is covered. My shame is covered. He would, have, he would have walked in one guy. All of David's sons. They said, I'm, I'm just making speculation. David was a handsome man. So I'm guessing all his boys look good too. Just ran in the family. They were probably ripped, you know, like Spartans. Don't know. But they were probably, oh, yeah? And I could imagine being Mephibosheth, like, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? I don't belong here. I don't have, I don't have what he has. Solomon, I don't have what he has. He's so smart. I don't have that. And some of us could walk in the church this way. Oh, come on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Some of us can walk in the church this way. Broken from our past. Broken from the hurts. Oh, they're not going to accept me. They're not going to love me there. I don't even know if Jesus can do anything in my life. I don't know if Jesus can help me. And then when we come and we give up our throne and we sit at the table, we look just like everybody else. We're in unity. We're accepted. We have grace and the mercy of God in our life. Can you stand your feet with me today? I believe God is inviting us today, maybe for the first time, maybe for, maybe for the 10th time today, to give up your throne, to allow Him to sit on the throne of your heart, to allow Him to be sitting on the throne of your life, and to come to the table of grace, to come to the table of mercy, to come to the table of unity and communion with Him. You see, this is what happens when I walk into church and when I walk into Christianity, sitting on the throne, I have a mentality of hierarchy and I have a mentality of, uh, of God that is not healthy. But when I come to the table, I have a mentality of relationship. I have a mentality of friendship with Jesus. He's Lord first, but He's friend. And he sits at the table with us. And I, and I just encourage us today to maybe afresh to give up your throne. To give up your throne. Can we close our eyes this morning? And those online, this is for all of us today to say, God is inviting me to give up my throne and sit at his table. Where I can be free from fear and free from insecurity and free from anxiety. With all eyes closed today, if today you're saying for the first time or maybe this is a fresh de dedication for you to say, I'm coming back to the table. I'm giving up my throne. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. If that's you, I'm going to pray for you. Just so I know who to pray for, can you just lift up a hand? That's all we're going to do. 
Just lift up a hand and say, that's me. I'm coming, I'm giving up my throne today. I'm giving up my throne to take his table, to take a seat at his table. If that's you, you're online, you can lift your hand as well. I'll pray for you. Anybody else wants to lift their hand and say, that's me. I'm, I'm coming to the table today. I'm giving up my throne. Maybe it's just a fresh start today. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you today. I thank you for those who say, I'm giving up my throne, my will, my purpose, so that I could take up his will and his purpose for my life. I'm giving up the throne and the control of my life, and I'm coming afresh to him today. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I thank you for that today. God, and that in all of us, we would take a posture of, we would take a posture of sitting at the table with him. Can we all just pray this? Can you just pray this prayer with me? Maybe this is the first time you've prayed this, watching the line or in the room. Say, Jesus, my throne is yours. You sit on the throne of my heart. I surrender. I'm coming to the table. Thank you for the grace and the mercy that's at the table. Thank you that you see me for who you made me to be. I'm at the table today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's worship one last time together. Let's just sink in your heart. If there's anything we can pray for you about, we'd love to pray. We'd love to encourage you. We'd love to bless you today. Come on, can we sing?